good evening and welcome. Tonight, we are going to be reading from this book. It's called A Child's Introduction to Norse Mythology, Odin, Thor, Loki, and other Viking gods, goddesses, giants, and monsters. This is part of my Viewer's Choice series where my subscribers get to pick what I talk about for the next two weeks, and by far the most requested was Norse mythology. Um, some people requested just mythology in general, but the ones that specifically wanted Norse mythology were Xavier Lamboy4824, Sammy Boo1043, JJ Medusa, and Luigi7834. I've done Greek mythology quite a bit on my channel. It's time for the Norse gods to shine, so let's dive right in. Norse mythology. I'm going to skip a couple bits of this book. I'm going to read to you all the things that you're going to need to know. Part 1. Who's who and what's what in the beginning. Every group of people has a story to explain how the world was created. This is how it all began for the Vikings. Before there was anything, any people, any animals, any sky, any seas, any noise, there was only fire and ice. To the south was Muspel, the realm of fire. Searing flames burned and sparked giving off the most intense heat. Nothing could live here. To the north was Niflheim, the realm of ice. Icicles and frost covered the land, holding the gray mist in a deep freeze. Nothing could live here. In between lay a great empty space called Ginnungagap. Eleven poisonous rivers of ice snaked through Niflheim and reached across Ginnungagap. As they neared the heat of Muspel, the ice began to melt. Water dripped, and the drips formed Ymir, the first frost giant, and Adumla, a huge cow without horns. The giant and the cow were both bigger than you'd ever dare to imagine. Ymir slept, and as he slept, he sweated. His children were born from his sweat. A male and female giant came from under his left arm, a six-headed giant came from his legs. From these three nasty, ugly giants, other giants were born. Meanwhile, Aldumla licked a salty block of ice. On the first day, a man's hair emerged from the ice. On the second day, his head came out. On the third day, his full body appeared. His name was Buri. Unlike Emir's children, he was tall, handsome, and good. Buri and one of the frost giants had a son called Bor. Bor married Bestla, also a giant, and they had three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. They were the first gods. The three brothers grew up in the emptiness of Ginnungagap. They wanted to build a world of living things. Ymir refused. He and his children were wicked and violent, and the brothers hated them. Odin knew Ymir must die in order for the world to begin. Odin stabbed the evil frost giant. Ymir's blood drowned all the evil frost giants, except Ymir's grandson, Bergomir, and his wife. They sailed away in a hollowed-out tree trunk. They are thought to be the father and mother of all giants. The giants never forgave the gods for the death of Ymir and became their deadly enemies. Odin, Vili, and Fe threw Ymir's body into Ginnungagap, and from his remains they made the world. 
his flesh was turned into soil. His bones became the mountains. His teeth became rocks. His hair became trees. His blood became the sea. They tossed his skull up high to make the sky. His brains floated out to become the clouds. The three brothers shot sparks from Muspel into the sky to be the stars. They placed a goddess named Sun and a god named Moon into two chariots of fire. Sun and Moon are chased across the sky by two savage wolves who try to eat them. Night, the daughter of a giant, and her son, Day, were given horse-drawn chariots to ride in, too. Every twenty-four hours, they have to make a circle around the world. The brothers divided up the land. They gave the giants the rocky coastlines to the north and called it Jotunheim. They dug up worms in soil that had been Emer's flesh and turned them into dwarves and dark elves. They sent them to live deep underground in Nidavellir and Svartalfheim. They made a land called Alfheim for the light elves. The middle of the earth was called Midgard. The gods built a wall around it from Emer's eyebrows to keep out the giants. Midgard had green meadows, rushing rivers, sandy beaches, majestic mountains, and a blue sky, but it was empty. A land this beautiful needed life. One day the brothers were walking along the beach and came upon logs from two trees, an ash and an elm. With a whoosh, Odin breathed life into them. Fay carved them into the shape of people. He let them see, hear, and speak. Fili gave them thoughts and feelings. The ash tree became Osk, the first man. The elm tree became Embla, the first woman. Osk and Embla are the father and mother of all humans. Odin and his brothers left the humans to live in Midgard. They crossed the Bifrost, a glittery rainbow bridge, to a world high above the earth called Asgard. Brothers found wives, had children, and soon filled Asgard with gods and goddesses. Finally, everything and everyone was in its place. But in a world of gods, giants, dwarves, and elves, all was not peaceful. There were battles to fight, injustices to avenge, wrongs to right, and tricks to play. The World Tree Yggdrasil is the mighty tree that stands in the center of the universe. The tree grows forever green, and its sturdy branches touch the very top of the sky. Its twisting roots and branches support the nine worlds that make up the universe, so it is called the World Tree. Everything is connected through Yggdrasil. Yggdrasil has three enormous roots. One reaches into Asgard, land of the gods, one reaches into Jotunheim, land of the giants, and one reaches into Niflheim, land of the dead. A spring flows under each root. The poisonous spring of Hvelgamir pools under Niflheim. The spring of wisdom, called Mimir's well, sits under Jotunheim. The well of Erd, the spring of fate, bubbles under Asgard. The well of Erd is cared for by three giantess sisters called the Norns. It's their job to feed Idrasil with water from the well of Erd to keep the universe healthy. The Norns also decide what will happen to you throughout your life. They weave a tapestry, and each thread in the tapestry is the fate of a single human or god. We're going to skip the animals here. I'm not really going to talk about nine worlds. Asgard is the land of the Aesir, the gods and goddesses of war. Asgard sits high in the clouds, and each god lives in a gorgeous gold and silver hall. The shimmering roofs of the halls cast a magical glow throughout the land. Vanaheim is the land of the Vanir, the fertility gods and goddesses. Vanaheim is a mysterious world that some say is filled with grey swirling mist. Alfheim is the land of the light elves who are happy and kind. Midgard, also known as Earth, is the land of humans. It is surrounded by oceans so wide and so deep that no human can cross to the other side. Jormungand, the horrible serpent, li lives in the ocean. Midgard is the only visible world. 
meaning the only world that humans can see. Nita Valir is the land of the dwarves. Dwarves live underground in caves and holes connected by a labyrinth of tunnels. They are highly skilled craftsmen and blacksmiths who can make any weapon or treasure. Svartalfheim, Svartalfheim is the land of the dark elves. Jotunheim is the land of the frost giants. It's covered with rugged mountains, icy peaks, thick forests, and swirling snowstorms. The giants' fortress, Utgard, is made from huge blocks of ice. The iron woods separate the giants from the humans in Midgard. The river Ifling, which never freezes over, separates the giants from the gods in Asgard. Niflheim is the land of the dead. It sits below all the other worlds. The sky is blanketed by a thick fog, and it's always bitter cold, damp, and dark. No joy or happiness can exist here. Humans who die of accidents, sickness, or old age end up here. Hell is the queen of Niflheim. Muspel is the land of fire. It is filled with blazing flames and scorching hot embers and coals. The evil demon Surt rules Muspel. He carries a flaming sword that burns hotter than the sun. Gods and Goddesses Norse gods are different from the gods you may have read about in Greek and Roman mythology. They're much more like humans. They experience pain, sadness, fear, jealousy, and joy. They get hungry, they play tricks, they make bad choices. Unlike Greek and Roman gods, Norse gods and goddesses don't live forever. Endings are not always happy for them. With the Norse gods and goddesses, anything can happen. I think the rest we're gonna not read because it's kind of spoilery. But... I'm also not going to read this section because there's huge spoilers in these, so let's just talk about the gods. We have Odin, Thor, Loki, Freak, Baldur, Hod, there's Tyr and Heimdall, Freya, she, she has her cats there, Frey, Njord, and there's a lot more that we're going to read more about. The big deal about giants. I think we've covered giants. And dwarves and elves. Dwarves live in the underground caves. They're master craftsmen. I think we got all that. The children of Loki and Angaboda. We're going to read all about them. Don't you worry. Let's get right into the stories. The myth. The war between the gods, or how Odin lost his eye and Mimir lost his head. Odin, father of the Aesir and creator of humans, had questions about the universe. Lots and lots of questions. He wanted to know everything about everything. But where would he find the great wisdom to learn the answers? Odin journeyed far into Jotunheim land of the frost giants, where Mimir's well bubbled. One thick root of Yggdrasil, the world tree, was fed by this magical well. The wise giant Mimir cared for the well. Mimir was also the god of memory. Odin greeted him. Please, Mimir, may I have a drink from your waters? Mimir shook his head. Only he was allowed to drink from his well of knowledge. It held the secrets of all nine worlds. Just one drink, Odin pleaded. I'll give anything for a sip. Anything? asked Mimir. I want your eye. Odin started to say no. Then he thought about it. What good was his eye when he couldn't understand all he saw? Besides, he had two eyes. Odin plucked out one of his eyes and plopped it into the well. Then he filled the horn called Gjallarhorn with the magic water. Odin drank it down. Cool water and wisdom flowed through his body. Odin now understood the universe. But Odin wanted more knowledge. For this, he would need to learn the secret of the runes, mysterious written symbols. No god understood what the runes meant. Odin went to Yggdrasil. 
the tall ash reached up to the splendor of Asgard and down to the darkness of Niflheim. Great wisdom lay within the tree. Odin thrust his spear through his body, pinning himself to the wide trunk. Odin hung from the tree for nine long days and nine long nights. He was cold, hungry, and in terrible agony, but he stayed on the tree. Gaining true wisdom required determination and pain. On the ninth night, Odin was close to death. Weak and dizzy, he looked down and saw mysterious letters on the tree's roots. These were the runes. The letters swirled, and their meaning suddenly became clear to him. He now knew the secrets of nature. He could cure sickness, direct the lost, calm a storm, speak to the dead, and see the future. Odin returned to Asgard filled with supreme wisdom. Sitting high on his throne, he looked over the great halls that glistened with brilliant gold. His children, the Aesir, lived in peace and harmony, and all was good. However, the Vanir did not think all was good. They lived in Vanaheim and were jealous of the brilliant glow of Asgard. They wanted gold, too. They sent the witch Gulvig to bring back riches for them. Gulvig swept into Asgard and stood before the Allfather. Give me gold now, she demanded. Odin did not like her greedy attitude, so he had her tossed into a big fire. But Gulvig walked out of the fire completely unharmed. She was a witch, after all. Where's the gold? the Vanir asked when she returned to Vanaheim. Gulvig told them what Odin had tried to do to her. The Vanir were angry. They declared war on the Aesir. Spells were cast. Walls crumbled. Battles raged on and on. With powerful gods fighting powerful gods, wise Odin knew that the war would only end with all the gods killing one another. He visited Njord, the ruler of the Vanir. We must declare a truce, Odin told him. Njord agreed. But how can we be sure that both sides will stop fighting? They decided to trade two gods each to keep the peace. The two best Vanir, Njord and his son Frey, would come live with the Aesir in Asgard. I'm going too, declared the goddess Freya. She refused to be left behind, so she went with her father and twin brother. The Aesir were honored to get such an amazing goddess in the deal. Odin chose handsome Honir and wise Mimir to live with the Vanir in Vanaheim. Honir became the Vanir's new leader. He made many clever decisions with Mimir by his side. The trade seemed fair and peace settled on the two lands. Until one afternoon when Honir was fixing his hair. He was proud of his thick hair. The Vanir called an emergency meeting. Honir searched for Mimir. Where was he? But Mimir was out in the countryside. Honir tried to stall, but the Vanir wanted their leader's advice right away. Without Mimir whispering in his ear, Honir couldn't make a decision. He had nothing wise to say at all. It soon became clear that although Honir looked good, he was lacking in the brains department. The Vanir were angry once more. The Aesir had tricked them into giving away Njord, their great ruler, for this fool. What did they do? They cut off Mimir's head and sent it to Odin. Odin was incredibly upset. Poor Mimir had done nothing wrong. Odin cradled Mimir's head and sang to it, magically giving it back the power of speech. He rubbed it with herbs so it would never rot. From then on, Mimir's head told its wisdom only to Odin. Mimir's head told Odin not to take revenge on the Vanir. A war between the gods would end in destruction. Odin listened to Mimir's head, and he went to Honir. Together they agreed that there would be no more fighting among the gods. Odin brought Mimir's head to the wall beneath Yggdrasil. He floated it alongside his eye, and the waters of knowledge kept it safe. In the days to come, it would whisper many secrets to Odin. Treasures of the Gods, or How Sif Lost Her Hair all the gods and goddesses in Asgard agreed that the goddess Sif had the best hair ever. 
Her silky yellow gold tresses rippled like a waterfall down her back. First thing every morning, Seif brushed her golden mane with one thousand strokes, causing each strand to shine brighter than the sun on a hot summer's day. One morning, Seif began to brush, and the bristles scraped bare skin. She let out a blood-curdling scream. Her husband, Thor, raced to her side and gasped in horror. Seif's golden hair had been chopped off while she'd slept. She was completely bald. Seif felt her bare scalp with her fingertips. Why, oh, who did this to me, she wailed. Loki, Thor, god of thunder, growled. It must have been Loki. Trouble is always caused by Loki. Thor stomped off to find Loki, god of mischief. When he spotted the trickster, Thor raised his large fist. You did this to her. Me? Do what? To who? Loki lied, backing away. I haven't done anything. Oh, really? Thor narrowed his blue eyes. Seif's hair was so pretty, and now it's... It's... Thor fumbled for the words. Gone? Loki filled in. Hacked off? Exactly. Thor's face grew redder than his fiery hair. I knew it was you. It was only a joke. You know, funny. Loki forced a hearty laugh. Not funny, Thor roared, roared Thor. <laughs> My wife is bald. I will pound you. And no need for violence, Loki nervously held up his hands. I can fix this. I'll get Seif's hair back, even more beautiful than before. I'll replace her hair with hair made of real gold. How's that? Thor lowered his fist. Fine, but if you don't, I will finish you. Loki hurried to Nita Valir, the underground land of the dwarfs. He made his way down long, winding tunnels, searching for the workshop of Brock and Aitri. They were said to be the most skilled craftsmen in all of the Nine Worlds. If anyone could spin hair out of gold, it would be these two dwarfs. Hello there, Loki poked his head into a cave and saw three dwarfs. He gave them his widest smile. I came from Asgard in search of Brock and Aitri to do important work for the gods. Are you them? Absolutely not, said one dwarf. We are the sons of Ivaldi. We're the most talented craftsmen around. Anything Brock and Aitri can build, we can build better. You don't say, Loki began to scheme. I've been sent on a very important mission to find three amazing gifts worthy of the gods. Are you up to it? We're up to it, said the second son of the Valdi. Let us do it, please. Loki scratched his head as if thinking over the matter. I guess I could give you boys a shot. I know. How about a contest against Brock and Aitri? Three gifts for the gods. The best gift wins. Bring it on, said the third son of the Valdi. Name your gifts. Loki told them they could create two gifts of their own choosing. But the third must be hair. Thor's wife is missing all her golden hair. So very strange and sad, but I'm trying to help her. I do that, you know. Uh, how about making hair spun of real gold? Loki left the sons of Ivaldi and found the cave of Brock and Aitri. Well, hello there, he called. I've come from the gods of the Aesir. I've been told by the sons of Ivaldi that their work is superior to yours. Oh, please, scoffed Brock. Those boys can't twist a pipe cleaner. Can't cut a snowflake out of paper, added Aitri. That's not how they tell it. In fact, Loki lowered his voice, they've challenged you to a contest. What kind of contest, asked Aitri. Three treasures worthy of the gods. The best gift wins, and the winning dwarves claim the title of best craftsman. Loki had a plan. He'd use the gifts made by these two talented dwarves to get the gods on his side. If Thor stayed angry, he'd bring Odin into it, and Loki would need all the help he could get. Brock knew not to trust the trickster. We pass. Oh, I see. 
You're scared. Loki's voice dripped with fake understanding. Well, if, if you feel you're not up to it. Not up to it. As if, cried Idri. We will battle the sons of Ivaldi for the title, but on one condition. If we win, we get your head. Excuse me? Loki was startled. If the gods choose one of our gifts as the best, we cut off your head. Deal? Fine, but only my head, said Loki. No hurting any other part of my body. Loki would make sure that Brock and I tree lost the contest. Then the gods would get amazing gifts, Seif would get her hair, and he'd still have his head. That won't be hard for someone as cunning as me, he thought. Brock and Aitri got to work. Aitri was a magnificent craftsman. Brock pumped his bellows to keep the furnace flames burning bright, so Aitri could twist and mold metal into fabulous treasures. The air from the bellows fanned the fire, making the flames dance. Don't stop pumping no matter what, Aitri warned his brother. If Brock stopped, the flames would die out and the metal wouldn't stretch. I tree threw an old pig skin into the fire. It crackled and sparked. Keep it hot, Brock, he said. A fly buzzed around Brock's ear. Brock shook his head, trying to shoo it away. The fly buzzed louder and louder. Brock didn't know the fly was really Loki. Loki had the power to shapeshift, and he turned himself into a fly. Brock wished he could swat the pesky fly, but he didn't dare take his hands off the bellows. The fly kept buzzing. Brock blew on the fly. The fly would not go away. He spit at the fly. The fly would not go away. Then the fly bit Brock's hand. Brock cried out in pain, but he never stopped pumping the bellows. Eyetree reached into the furnace and pulled out a large boar with shiny gold bristles. Well done, bro, called Brock. Keep it hot, Idri told his brother. He threw a lump of gold into the fire. Loki the fly began to panic. He couldn't let these dwarves make another fabulous gift. He bit Brock's neck hard. Ow, howled Brock, but he still didn't stop pumping. Idri shaped the lump of gold. He transformed it into a thick golden arm ring. Loki the fly gasped. The gods would love these gifts and he would surely lose his head. No more Mr. Nice Fly, he told himself, as I tree placed a piece of iron in the fire. Loki the fly zoomed full speed toward Brock and bit his eyelids. Brock shuddered in agony. He whipped his head back and forth, trying to fling off the vicious fly. Loki the fly held on, biting again and again. Brock's eyelids swelled. Tears streamed down his cheeks. He could barely see. Don't slack off, brother. Keep up the pace, called Idri. Brock groaned and made himself pump faster. Finally, Idri pulled the iron from the fire. From it, he'd made an enormous silver hammer. The handle's too short. It needed more heat, he grumbled to Brock. Then he looked over at him. What's with your eyes? A pest did it, said Brock, as he saw the fly dart behind a big rock and change back into Loki. I need a nap, I treoned. You take these gifts to the gods in Asgard and then cut off Loki's head. Gladly, said Brock. In Asgard, Loki brought Brock and the three sons of Ivaldi into Gladstein, Odin's golden hall. Odin sat on his throne. Next to him sat Thor and Frey, god of the harvest. They would be the judges. You must choose whose gifts are better, the three gifts made by the sons of Ivaldi, or the three gifts made by Brock and Idri, Loki told them. The first son of Ivaldi stepped forward with a pile of golden hair. The hair is spun from real gold. It will magically attach to Sif's head and grow there forever, long and beautiful. Sif placed the hair on her bald head. Instantly, the hair became one with her scalp. The golden tresses flowed down her back and radiated more sunshine than ever before. Seif smiled. I like it. Good job, boomed Thor. The second son of Ivaldi stepped toward Odin. I present to you with the magical spear called Gungnir. 
The spear will always hit its target. Try it out. Throw it at the smudge of dirt on the floor. At the far end of the hall. <laughs> Odin squinted his one eye. I can't see any smudge. He threw the spear anyway. The spear hit the smudge. The gods cheered. Impressive, said Odin. For Frey, I have this. The third son of Uvaldi pulled a tightly folded paper from a pouch. When unfolded, this little paper becomes a huge boat called Skirdbladnir. It is sturdy enough to hold one hundred gods. It will always sail in fair winds, and you can fold it up and carry it with you. Frey beamed. It's incredible. Loki let out his breath. These are three amazing gifts. I don't need to worry. One is sure to win. My head will be just fine. Odin turned to Brock, whose eyes were still swollen. What did you bring us? My brother and I made this arm ring for you. It is called Dropnir. Brock handed the Allfather the solid gold arm ring. Odin tested its weight. Why is it so heavy? Because every ninth night, the ring will drip eight times and create eight more gold rings of the same weight, said the dwarf. Odin, who never grinned, grinned. Brock turned to Frey. I present you with Gullimbursti, the boar with the golden bristles. He will pull your chariot as fast as the wind and light the darkness, so you can always find your way. Then Brock handed the silver hammer to Thor. This is Mjolnir. It is the most powerful hammer ever. It can never be broken, and it will always return to your hand. Thor inspected it. Mm, handle's too short. Brock hung his head. That's my fault. Loki smirked. The gods huddled together and chose. Thor's hammer is the winner. It didn't matter that the handle was short. With the mighty hammer, Thor could keep Asgard safe from giants and trolls. Brock and I tree were named Best Craftsmen. Wait, no, cried Loki. That, what about Sneef's hair? Isn't it better than a hammer with a short handle? Sneef's hair is pretty, agreed Thor. But my hammer will never miss its target and can grow and shrink to the size I want it to be. How cool is that? Brock stepped up to Loki. Your head, please. We had a deal. Loki gulped. This had not gone as planned. He tried to make a run for it. Thor caught him. Cut off his head now, he said, handing the trickster to Brock. Not so fast, said Loki. Our deal was that you can have my head, but you can't hurt any other part of me. That means you can't touch my neck. There was no way to take Loki's head off his body without harming his neck. Loki had tricked them. Brock let Loki go. In the end, Sif got back her golden hair and the gods received their most prized treasures, all because of Loki's tricks. The Walls of Asgard, or Tale of an Eight-Legged Horse. Thor was away fighting trolls to the east, and the Aesir were worried. The wall around Asgard had been destroyed during the battle between the Aesir and the Vanir. Without a wall and without Thor, they were unprotected from frost giants and trolls. Even with their magic, the gods couldn't build a strong enough wall. So when a stranger appeared in Asgard and said he was a master builder, they listened. I can build a stone wall so tall and so thick that no one will get through, he bragged. And I can do it fast. I'll finish in a year and a half. The gods raised their eyebrows at one another. The builder's offer seemed too good to be true. How much gold do you want for your work? asked Odin. The builder rubbed the shiny gray coat of the magnificent stallion he'd ridden in on and shook his head. No gold. What then? asked Loki. Loki was always on the lookout for other tricksters. Three things, that's all, said the builder. I would like the goddess Freya to be my wife. I would like the sun, and I would like the moon. No way, cried Frey, brother of Freya. Odin stroked his long beard. We need to talk about this. Would you wait over there? He pointed the builder to a nearby stream, then gathered the gods. What's to talk about? demanded Frey when the builder left. He's beneath her. I'll say. 
There's no way I'm marrying that guy, Freya, goddess of love and beauty, put her hands on her hips. Her red gold hair was braided in a crown. Don't even think you can sell me like that. Also, we can't give up the sun and the moon, Balder, god of light, raised his fair face to the sky. Let's forget it, said Heimdall, the watchman. The builder's price is too high. True, said Odin. We will find another way. Hold up, Loki stepped forward. You're all being too hasty. Let's think about this. This stranger offers to build a high, thick stone wall surrounding Asgard in only 18 months. Impossible. It can't be done. What are you saying? asked Balder. Loki sighed. Why couldn't these gods keep up with his superior logic? I'm saying that we will win. Freya will not have to marry him, and the sun and the moon will stay in the sky where they belong. The stranger will build us a good part of the wall for free, and then time will run out. We will shoo him out of Asgard, and someone else can finish the wall. What if he can build the wall? Freya narrowed her eyes at Loki. Nonsense! Loki turned away from Freya's icy glare. We'll make it harder. He will only get six months, and he can't have any help building the wall. All the gods except Freya liked Loki's plan. They thought it quite clever. Odin called the builder over and told him the terms. He agreed. But only if my stallion Zvalafari can help me carry the rocks. A horse? Of course. Loki didn't think one horse would make a difference. Odin and the Builder shook hands on the deal. The next day, gray clouds blanketed the winter sky, and a frigid wind howled. But the Builder worked with unstoppable energy. He traveled deep into the mountains, and his strong horse hauled back boulder after boulder. The Builder worked with the strength of a giant. Svaldafari carried massive weights of stone without stopping for a rest or a drink of water. The gods watched in amazement. Could the horse be magical, they wondered. The builder stacked each boulder tightly, stone after stone. The builder and his horse worked night and day without sleep. They worked through blizzards and ice storms. The wall grew taller and taller. Three days before the end of winter, Odin grimly gathered the gods around his throne. The wall is nearly done. He has only a small part to finish. I fear we may lose Freya, the sun, and the moon. Freya pointed at Loki. This is all your fault. Loki thinks he's so clever, but he always brings trouble. Freya wrapped his arm around his sister. Without dear Freya, we will be lost. She brings light to Asgard. Without the sun and the moon in the sky, we'll all live in darkness, added Balder. Loki must be punished, said Heimdall. I say we send for Thor. Freya seethed with anger. He'll punish Loki with his hammer. Whoa! Let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's still time. I'll make sure that wall is never finished. Loki definitely did not want Thor involved. How will you do that? demanded Odin. Just leave the details to me. Loki walked off confidently, as if he had a great plan. In truth, he had no idea what to do. But he'd figured it out. He would figure it out. He always did. Loki sat under a pine tree and watched the builder and his stallion work. Svodfari dragged each massive stone down from the mountain with unwavering focus. That night, as the full moon rose, a black mare appeared by the pine tree. The builder and Svodfari were heading back to the mountains for more stone. The mare whinnied, and Svodfari's ears pricked up. She whinnied again. Svandafari turned his head in her direction. Then the mare galloped off, kicking up fresh snow on the frozen field. Svandafari watched in wonder. This horse was beautiful. She whinnied once more, and Svandafari chased after her. No, stop, called the builder. Svandafari didn't stop. He galloped faster, his eyes on the mare. The mare ran into the forest, and Svandafari followed. Builder lumbered to keep up, shouting all the while, but soon he lost sight of his stallion. He searched all night, but his horse was gone. 
The sun rose and the builder had no choice but to work alone. He could only drag one stone from the mountain in the time Svaldafari had dragged ten. He worked all day and the next night, collapsing with exhaustion. Without his stallion, he'd never finish the wall in time. I've been tricked, he bellowed. The builder looked about for someone to blame, but he was all alone. The gods sat around cozy fires inside their halls. His anger bloomed into a rage, and his body swelled into that of a gruesome giant. Grr, I will destroy this wall. I will destroy you all, he cried. Luckily, at that very moment, Thor was on his way home. He heard the giant's roar and rushed back to Asgard. He raised his mighty hammer and smashed the giant on the head. The giant dropped dead. The gods raced outside and let up a cheer. Freya, the sun, and the moon are saved. Good work, Thor, said Odin. Freya looked around. Not that I care, but where's Loki? The trickster was nowhere in sight. In fact, he stayed missing for several months. Then one day, Loki returned to Asgard. He led a colt with a shiny silver-gray coat. The baby horse looked very much like Svaldafari, except it had eight legs, four in the front and four in the back. The eight-legged horse could fly through the sky and gallop through the ocean's waves. He was faster than any other horse. Loki gave this magnificent horse to Odin, and Odin named him Sleipnir. Loki stood to the side and waited for someone to thank him for saving Asgard from the horrible giant. He waited and waited. No one ever thanked him. Did they know that Loki had shapeshifted and he had been the Black Mirror? I think that's maybe my favorite story. Loki's children, or how Tyr lost his hand. Beware, the three Norns called to Odin one day as he walked by the well of Erd. Odin stopped and paid close attention. The Norns were powerful giantesses who weave each god's and human's fate, who weave, who wove, <laughs> who wove each god's and human's fate in their tapestry of life. They decided what would become of everyone. Tell me more, said Odin. Beware of the trickster Loki's young children. When the end comes, as it will, Loki's children will cause the death of you and all the gods, said the Norns. Odin thought of the three hideous children Loki had just had with a giantess Ankuboda, Fenrir, a wolf, Jormungard, a serpent, and Hel, who was half beautiful girl and half rotting corpse. He shuddered. He'd get them out of Asgard immediately. First, Odin grabbed Jormungand, who spat venom from his fangs. Odin hurled him into the deep gray sea surrounding Midgard. When the snake hit the water, he began to grow. He grew and grew. Soon the serpent was so enormous that his body wrapped completely around the land of the humans. Then Odin turned to Loki's daughter, Hel, who glowered at him. Decaying flesh hung from one side of her face. Her other cheek was smooth and rosy. Odin banished the girl to the darkness of Niflheim, granting her rule over the frozen realm of the dead. Down in the gloom, she had received those who died from an accident, sickness, or old age. Heroes who died in battle would be sent to Odin's own hall, Valhalla, in Asgard. Finally, Odin turned to Fenrir. He was only a small wolf cub. What harm could he do? Odin allowed Fenrir to stay in Asgard. But as the days passed, Fenrir's body grew larger, his fangs grew longer, his claws grew sharper, his growl grew louder, and he became meaner and meaner. Soon he was a gigantic, snarling, ferocious beast. Please do something, the gods pleaded to Odin. This savage wolf will hurt us all. Odin went to Loki. He told him to tie up Fenrir. Loki laughed. Forget it. I'd never do that to my own son. But Loki wasn't telling the truth. That wasn't the real reason. Loki was as afraid of Fenrir as the gods were. Any volunteers to tie up the wolf? Odin asked the gods gathered around his throne. No one raised a hand. It was too dangerous a task even for the gods. Odin decided to trick Fenrir. He called the wolf to him. This is the strongest chain in Asgard, 
Odin held up a thick iron chain. It is so incredibly strong that I bet even your strength is no match for it. Oh, please. Fenrir was proud of how strong he'd grown. I am tougher than your chain. Wrap it around me. Go on. He let them bind him with the heavy chain. The gods grinned. How easy. The dumb wolf had pretty much tied himself up. Bam! Fenrir arched his back and busted the chain into bits. Quickly, Odin found another chain, twice as thick and twice as heavy as the first one. Fenrir allowed himself to be tied up again. This time, the gods wrapped the chain tighter. They made a big or not. Bam! Fenrir shattered this chain, too. The gods huddled around Odin. What should we do now? We need magic to contain him. Odin instructed Skirnir, a light elf who was Frey's messenger, to visit the dwarves and ask them to craft the strongest chain ever. Skirnir travels to Nidavellir, where the dwarves had their underground workshops. The dwarves could forge the most amazing treasures from metals and doors. When Skirnir returned, he presented Odin with a thin silk ribbon. What's this? Odin was surprised. It's so flimsy. The dwarves call it Glipnir, said Skirnir. It was braided from the nose of the noise of a cat's paws, the breath of a fish, the beard of a young woman, the saliva of a bird, the roots of a mountain, and the sinews of a bear. They say Glipnir is unbreakable. Odin called over Fenrir. May I test your strength one more time? Test away, drool dripped from Fenrir's glistening fangs. I will break all your chains, all father. Then Fenrir saw the ribbon. Instantly, he was suspicious. I'm not going up against dwarf magic. Wait, said Odin. If this magic thread does bind you, then we have no choice, no cause to fear you, and we'll let you go free. Free? Really? Fenrir thought about it. I'll agree to let you tie me up with that magic ribbon, only if one of you puts his hand in my mouth while you do. This way you can't go back on your word. All the Aesir stared at Fenrir's long, pointy fangs. No one spoke. Tyr, the bravest of all the gods, stepped forward. He placed his right hand inside the snarling wolf's mouth. Odin wrapped the ribbon around the wolf's hairy body. He tied it around all four feet. He knotted it tightly to a large rock. Let's do this, said Tyr. Fenrir arched his back. He thrashed from side to side. His eyes bulged as he fought to get free. The more he struggled, the tighter the ribbon grew. It would not break. Fenrir grew tired. Your magic ribbon won. Now let me go. But Odin and the gods refused to untie him. Fenrir was angry. He'd been tricked, and now he'd be tied up forever. Growling and foaming at the mouth, he snapped his jaws shut and bit off Tyr's hand. Tyr howled. His right hand was gone. He'd have to learn to hold a sword with his left hand. The gods kept Fenrir tied up. They left him in a swamp. There he will stay until the end of the world, when he'll finally break free and go after Odin for a promise never kept. Edun and the Magic Apples, or the Great Eagle and Falcon Chase. The goddess Edun lived in a beautiful garden in Asgard. In her garden, flowers always bloomed, giving off the sweetest perfume. The ripest fruit hung from the trees, and the grass grew green and lush. Nothing ever withered or died in Edun's garden. Edun was as sweet as her fruit, and the gods visited her garden for the magic apples she kept in a golden box. Eating one apple kept the god young, but after a time the apple's magic wore off. The god's bones would begin to ache, and his skin would wrinkle. So he'd return to Eden for another apple, and he'd be young again. One time, Odin, Loki, and Honir, an old god who'd once been traded to the Vanir to keep the peace, were journeying through Midgard. They had traveled across the wide deserts and tall mountains that bordered Jotunheim, land of the frost giants. They had grown weary and hungry. Time to eat, Loki, said Odin. Loki looked inside his pack and gulped. Oh no, he'd forgotten to pack food for their journey. Loki was never very dependable when it came to practical things, but he was quick to invent solutions. Look there, 
Loki pointed to the valley where a herd of cattle grazed. Fresh meat is really the way to go. Loki caught an ox and roasted its meat over an open fire. Odin and Honir waited eagerly to take a bite. Loki tested the meat. It was raw. He kept it over the fire to cook longer. Loki tested it again and again. The meat hadn't roasted at all. What's going on? wondered Loki. Annoyed, he inspected the fire, but the flames burned high and bright. Is this one of your tricks? demanded Odin. Why would you say that? I don't know what's wrong, began Loki. I know. An enormous eagle perched atop the tallest pine tree interrupted them. I used magic to make sure that ox would never cook in your fire. I will fix your fire if you share your meat with me. I eat first, then you eat. The gods agreed. The huge bird blew magic on the fire. The flames crackled and roasted the ox. Then the eagle swooped down and greedily grabbed the best parts of the meat. Hey, that's not sharing. Loki grabbed his spear and tried to smack the eagle away. His spear stuck into the eagle's side. The eagle glared at Loki and flapped his large wings. It rose into the air, dragging the spear and Loki with him. Loki couldn't let go. Magic had glued his hands to his spear. The eagle flew close to the ground. He banged Loki against jagged rocks, through prickly bushes, and under cold river water. Ow, let me go, cried Loki. Please stop. I will only stop if you promise to bring Edun and her apples to me in the forest, said the eagle. Loki knew Edun never left her garden in Asgard. He knew no one besides gods was permitted to eat the apples of youth. But bruised and battered, Loki only cared about saving himself. You got it, he told the eagle. The eagle pulled the spear from his side, and Loki tumbled to the ground. Loki limped back to Odin and Honir, who had finished the meat without him. He told them about the eagle, naturally leaving out the part about Edun and the apples. They laughed. Imagine being carried away by an eagle. Loki didn't find it funny. Not at all. He hadn't planned on keeping his promise to the eagle until now. The next day, Loki went to Eden's garden. Hello there, he called to the goddess. You look awfully pretty. An apple a day and all that. I could use an apple myself. Really? Eden kept track of who was in need of one of her apples. You're looking good. I try. Loki ran his fingers through his thick, dark hair. Feeling a bit tired, though. Run down. Aiden gave him a magic apple. Loki ate it, the juices running down his chin. So the strangest thing happened. Loki leaned against her apple tree. I was walking in the forest, and I saw a tree with apples just like yours. That can't be, said Aiden. My magic apples are one of a kind. I fear you may be wrong. These may even be better. Loki shook his head, pretending to be dismayed. Impossible, said Eden. I know, right? You be the judge. Loki reached for her hand. Let me show you. It won't take long. Oh, and bring your golden box of apples so we can compare. Eden was curious, so she let Loki lead her out of Asgard. They crossed the Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge, and entered the forest of Midgard. As they walked, the trees grew tall and thick, blocking the sun. Eden searched for an apple tree, but all she saw were pine trees. I think we should turn back. At that moment, an enormous eagle swooped down from the tallest tree. It grabbed Eden and her golden box in its claws. Eden screamed. I'm not really an eagle, said the great bird. I am the giant Thiazi in disguise. I've come to take you and your apples to my great hall in the mountains of Jotunheim. And with that, he carried them away. A giant? Well, that explains a lot, Loki muttered. Over the next few days, the gods in Asgard felt the effects of age for the first time. Thor's back ached. Frey's hair turned gray. Frey shuffled when he walked. Heimdall had trouble hearing. They all took naps. The gods visited Eden's garden for an apple. Flowers no longer bloomed there. The plants had turned brown. Where's Eden? they asked. Bragi, god of poetry, didn't know what had become of his wife. He wanted to search for Edun, but he didn't have the energy. He'd grown too old. 
Odin called a meeting of the frail and feeble gods. Odin's one eye had turned cloudy, yet he still looked at Loki suspiciously. Loki looked awfully young and healthy. Of course, Odin didn't know that Loki had been the last to eat a magic apple. But Odin did know that if there was trouble, Loki was involved. Where's Eden? Odin demanded. Her? Well, it's like this, Loki stalled. With an aching back and a shaky old man grip, Thor raised his mighty hammer. Spill it, Loki. I saw Thiazi take her. You know the giant. He's holding her prisoner in his hall high in the mountains, confessed Loki. And you just let him take her, croaked Thor. I will pound you. No need. I will get her back. Quick, quick. You'll see, promised Loki. Loki thought fast. How would he do this? The giant was way bigger and stronger than he was. Plus, Aiden was on top of a high mountain, and that would take forever to climb. Freya, lend me your falcon feather cloak, said Loki. Freya started to protest, but she had trouble remembering what she'd meant to say. She handed Loki the cloak. Loki wrapped it around his shoulders and flew to the land of the giants. He flew through the highest window in Thiazi's hall. Aiden sat in a corner of the room her arms wrapped around her knees. The box of apples lay by her side. The Aussie had gone to the sea to fish, but he'd returned soon. Loki used magic and turned Edun into a nut. Grabbing the nut, he soared through the sky. At the same time, the Aussie walked up the mountain path toward his castle. He looked into the air and saw the shiny black wings of a falcon. He knew it was Loki. The Aussie turned himself back into an eagle. He soared after the falcon. Loki flew fast. The Ozzy flew faster. The eagle gained on the falcon. From his throne in Asgard, Odin watched the chase. He instructed the gods to stack a huge pile of wood near the walls of Asgard. Here comes Loki, called Heimdall, watchman of the gods. Loki the falcon flew over the wall, entering Asgard. Here comes the Ozzy, called Heimdall. Light the fire! God set fire to the wood pile and it burst into flames as the Ozzy crossed over the wall. The flames ignited his wings. The Ozzy tumbled to the ground. Thor waited with his mighty hammer. He pounded the giant, killing him. Loki used magic and turned the nut back into Eden and her apples. She quickly handed each of the gods an apple and they became young once more. Even Loki got an apple because Eden was still as sweet as her fruit. Revenge of the Giant's Daughter, or the God with the Nice Feet. Inside a cave in the steep Jotunheim mountainside, the giantess Scotty poked the fire and wondered what was keeping her father. She peered out over the land, searching for his hulking figure. All she saw was an eagle chasing a falcon in the sky. Something was wrong. Theazi was never late for dinner, especially when they were having goat. Days went by and her father didn't return. Scotty finally learned that Thiazi had been killed by the gods. At first she wept, then she grew angry. She strapped on her helmet and grabbed her sword and shield. She headed to Asgard to avenge her father. Heimdall, watchman of the gods, let out a cry of alarm as Scotty crossed the icy waters of the river Ifing. Thor appeared with his magic hammer in his hand. Move out of my way, Scotty tried to push past the red-bearded god. Hardly, Thor raised his hammer. Wait, Thor. From his throne in the hall, Odin had seen Scotty enter Asgard. Now he hurried toward them. Let's hear what she has to say. You killed my father, Scotty bravely stared Odin in his one eye. I'm sure you can kill me too. I don't care. I am ready to die to bring honor to Thiazi's name. She jabbed her sword at him. Stop that. Odin caught the blade in his hand. We will not kill or hurt you. We won't? asked Thor. He liked nothing more than pounding giants. No, I feel bad that I killed her father, and I respect her courage, Odin told Thor. He turned to Skadi. What would you like from me? Can you bring my father back to life? she asked hopefully. I cannot, he said. How about a gift of gold? Skadi shook her hand, her head. Scotty shook her head. What would she do with gold? She lived a simple life in the mountains. 
She sighed. She was lonely now without her father. That gave her idea. I'd like a husband, said Scotty. A kind, noble god with a good sense of humor. Scotty looked at the gods who'd gathered around. Her gaze landed on Balder. Balder's wavy golden hair gleamed in the sunlight, and his honey brown eyes twinkled. From his square jaw to his smooth skin, Balder was the best looking god. Scotty wanted to marry him. Of course, Odin knew what she was thinking. He knew most everything. So Odin added the twist. I will grant you a god for a husband, but you must choose him by his feet. The gods' bodies and faces will be covered. All you will be able to see is their feet. Scotty's heart fluttered as she gazed upon gorgeous Balder. A god this amazing looking definitely had to have amazing looking feet. Choosing him would be easy. The gods lined up behind a long tapestry. Scotty walked by inspecting their bare feet. Hairy big toes? No. Bumpy knuckles? No. Toe fungus? No. Extra toe? No. Sweaty cheese smell? Definitely no. She stopped in front of the final pair of feet. The skin was softer than a baby's. Each toe and toenail was perfectly shaped, and they smelled like melted butter. These feet must belong to Balder, thought Scotty. And how beautiful Balder would and now beautiful Balder would belong to her. She chose those feet. The god showed himself and Scotty gasped. The gorgeous feet did not belong to Balder. His had the bumpy knuckles. They belonged to old Njord, father of Frey and Freya. Njord was a Vanir god who'd been traded to the Aesir in the early days to keep the peace. He was god of the seas. Njord's skin was chopped and weathered. His scraggly gray beard was caked with salt. His back was bent. His hands swelled like fish. Smelled like fish, of course. Scotty was not happy at all. Because she'd made a deal with Odin, she married Njord. She became the goddess of winter and skiing. Over time, Scotty discovered Njord was kind and noble and told hysterical jokes. Everything she'd wanted in a husband. And he had nice feet that smelled like butter. The only problem the happy couple had was where to live. Scotty hated the salty sea air and the scratchy sand. The seagulls' high-pitched screams made her want to tear out her hair. Njord hated the frigid mountain winds and the icy, narrow pathways of Scotty's homeland. The wolves' mournful howls gave him the shivers. What did they do? They spent nine days at the sea and nine days in the mountains. Then they did it all again. Odin threw in a bonus gift for Scotty. He presented her with two shiny balls. These are your father's eyes. He tossed them high into the sky, where they transformed into sparkling stars. Now your father will always be with you. You can look up to find him in the night sky, and he can look down upon you. This is the constellation Gemini. That's next. This is my favorite story. Thor's Lost Hammer, or how Thor almost married a giant. Where's my hammer? roared Thor. He rolled out of bed and frantically searched Bl Bilsknir, his huge hall. His magic hammer, called Mjolnir, had been made for him by the dwarves. It was the most powerful weapon in Asgard. It always hit its target and always returned to Thor's hand. It kept the gods safe from giants and trolls. Thor never went anywhere without his hammer. He even slept with it. So where was it now? Loki! Thor hurried to find the god of mischief. Loki, give me back my hammer. Loki swung open his front door. I don't have your hammer. Thor waited to hear a story. Loki always tried to talk his way out of trouble when he was guilty, but this time Loki stayed silent. Thor realized that Loki had not taken his hammer. If it wasn't you, that means, started Thor. Your hammer was stolen by a frost giant, finished Loki. I'll help you find the giant who did it. Why would you help me? Thor asked suspiciously. Don't flatter yourself, Thor, said Loki. I'm not helping you, I'm helping me. Without your hammer, none of us in Asgard are safe. Loki went to see Freya, the goddess of love and beauty. Freya sat in a golden chair in her sparkly hall. Two gray cats curled by her feet, waiting eagerly to pull her chariot. 
She scratched their ears and they purred. She raised her emerald green eyes as Loki entered. You look radiant, dear Freya, said Loki. Truly gorgeous. Freya ignored Loki's flattery. She knew he couldn't be trusted. What do you want, Loki? Your falcon cloak, said Loki. I need it to fly. I'll bring it back when I'm done. Freya laughed. Never. I won't lend it out. Thor's hammer's been stolen, said Loki. Oh no, cried Freya. You must get it back. Take the cloak. Loki wrapped himself in Freya's cloak of gleaming falcon feathers. With the magic cloak around his shoulders, he soared into the air. He flew swiftly across the nine worlds until he reached Jotunheim, land of the giants. From the sky, he scanned the ground below. He spotted an ugly giant named Thrym sitting on a rock. Thrym had a bulbous nose, bulging eyes, and tufts of hair growing from his ears. Something about him seemed suspicious. Thrym, good to see you again. Well, not really. Loki had been born a giant, and he tried hard to forget that. Visits back here made his skin crawl. What do you want? Thrym grinned mischievously, as if he knew a secret. I want what you have, said Loki. Thor's hammer. Leave it to you, sneaky Loki, to figure it out. Thrym gave a deep chuckle. Yes, I stole Thor's precious hammer. I buried it eight miles under the earth. You'll never get it back. Unless... Loki sighed. Unless what? Unless I get to marry beautiful Freya, said Thrym. How about buckets of gold instead, offered Loki. Mountains of gold, in fact. I don't want your gold. All I want is Freya. Bring her here, and after our wedding, I will give you back the hammer. Deal? Loki didn't answer. He flew back to Asgard and delivered the news. Again? Are you out of your mind? cried Freya. There's no way I'm marrying that disgusting giant. Oh, come on, Freya, said Loki. I mean, don't you even start warned Freya. Her two cats hissed at him. It will never, ever happen. Get out. Odin called the gods and goddesses together. They all agreed that Freya should not be made to marry a giant. Then how will I get my hammer back? demanded Thor. Odin asked for ideas, but no idea was good. Finally, Heimdall, watchman of the gods, raised his hand. I may have something. Speak, said Odin. Thrym wants Freya, so I say we give him Freya. Not the real Freya, but Thor dressed up as Freya, explained Heimdall. What? Thor's face blazed red. I cannot dress like Freya. Oh, yes, you can, said Odin. Dressed as a bride, you can sneak into the land of the giants without them knowing who you are. Do it quickly before they attack Asgard. This plan is our best hope to get your hammer back. I won't be able to pull it off. I'm not good at things like that, protested Thor. I am, Loki told Thor. I will dress as your maidservant and be by your side. We'll trick Thrym together. The goddesses took Thor and Loki with them. They sewed a long skirt to cover Thor's hairy legs and a blouse that reached across his broad shoulders. They hung Freya's sparkling necklace of the bristlings around his thick neck. Then they covered his face and beard with a wedding veil. No one will believe this, grumbled Thor. Oh, yes, they will, Loki twirled in his long dress and headscarf. I look quite beautiful, don't I? Thor groaned. He and Loki climbed into his chariot, pulled by his two goats, Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder, and off through the sky, and set off through the sky, to Jotuni. They landed close to the rock where Thrym still sat. Keep your face down and let me do the talking, Loki whispered to Thor. Thrym, my friend, we have traveled for eight days and eight nights, and I have brought your bride to be. Thrym lumbered to his gnarly feet and clapped his swollen hands in delight. Freya is here. We'll have a wedding tonight. He instructed his servants to prepare a wedding feast. That night, Thor and Loki, dressed as Freya and her maid, joined Thrym and his guests at his long table. Thrym insisted the bride sit at his right side. Loki, the maid, sat to his left. 
plates of roasted meats with savory sauces were piled on the table, along with a whole ox and several of the largest fish Thor had ever seen. He licked his lips under the veil. Thor was hungry, and the food smelled delicious. The women all took dainty bites and ate small portions. Not Thor. Lifting his veil slightly, he shoveled the food into his mouth, chewing loudly. He ate several whole fish and half the ox on his own. Then he gulped down five large glasses of mead and let out a loud, smelly burp. Oh my, exclaimed Thrym. I've never known a goddess with such a big appetite. Are you okay, Freya? She's fine, Loki jumped in. She was so excited to marry you that she hasn't eaten in days. She's just hungry. Loki shot Thor a warning look to cool it with the food, but Thor was too busy slurping down cold herring fish to catch it. Is it time for the wedding? Thrym pushed away his own plate. Not yet, Loki pointed to the sticky cakes being served. Can't miss dessert, best part. Let me see my bride's beautiful face. Thrym reached over and tugged Thor's veil before Loki could stop him. Thrym gasped. Freya's eyes glow red like fire. Why is she so angry? It's not fire. It's the fire of happiness, said Loki quickly. She's so happy that she has not slept. As it should be, Thrym grinned. It's best for us to get married. Bring me Thor's hammer, he told his servant. Thor let out a cry when he saw his mighty hammer, but Loki talked over him. The hammer must rest in the bride's lap as you say your vows. It's for good luck. That's how it's done in Asgard. Thrym agreed, and the servant placed the hammer on Thor's lap. Thor wrapped his hand around the familiar handle. Then he let out a thunderous roar and stood to his full height. Pushing back his veil, he threw the hammer at Thrym. It hit the giant squarely between the eyes, killing him instantly. Then the trusty hammer returned to Thor's hand. Let's crush more giants, cried Thor. Let's just get out of here, Loki pulled Thor toward the chariot, both of them tripping over their long skirts as the giants chased them. They flew back to Asgard, bringing Thor's hammer with them. Thor never lost it again. Frey and Gerd, or a sword for love. Frey looked to his left. He looked to his right. Glad shame, Odin's great hall, seemed to be empty. No gods or servants were about. Odin was traveling in Midgard disguised as an old man. Frey, god of the harvest, gazed up at Odin's golden throne. Did he dare? Only Odin was allowed to sit on his high throne. From here, Odin could view all of the nine worlds. Sometimes Frigg, goddess of love and beauty, sat there, but that was an entirely other thing. She was his wife, after all. Frey couldn't control his curiosity. A quick look, he reasoned. That won't be so bad. He sat on the throne. His eyes widened in amazement. He could see everything. He saw a ladybug on a leaf in Elfheim, land of the light elves. He saw an earthworm wriggling around in Nidavellir, land of the dwarves. And in Jotunheim, land of the giants, he saw, for he sucked in his breath, he saw the most beautiful giantess ever. Her blonde hair hung in two long braids, and her snow-white skin glowed in the sunlight. Frey's heart squeezed in his chest. Frey wandered back home. Frey wandered back home to Alfheim, thinking only of the beauty he'd just seen. He couldn't eat or sleep. All he could do was dream of her. Who was she? Frey soon learned that she was Gerd, daughter of the giant Gimir. She was known far and wide for the brilliant light that shined around her. There was no way she would ever love him back. For days, Frey refused to come out of his room. He feared his unhappiness was punishment for sitting on his throne. On the throne, he stopped sending sunlight into the world. He stopped making rain. Crops turned brown and died. Frey's father, Njord, god of the seas, grew concerned. He sent for Skirnir, Frey's trusty light elf messenger. My son talks to you. Find out what troubles him. Please do whatever it takes to make Frey happy again. I'm in love with Gerd, Frey confessed to Skirnir. A god can't ask a giantess to marry him, so I will remain forever sad without her. And even if I could go to her, she'd never agree to be with me. 
she glows with incredible beauty. What if I go to her for you? asked Skirnir. Would you really? Frey grabbed Skirnir's shoulders. It's a long, dangerous journey. I'll go if you give me your horse. Your horse can leap through fire, said Skirnir, and your sword, too. Frey's sword had been a gift from the dwarves. It could fight giants and trolls by itself. It didn't need a hand to hold it. The sword was his most prized treasure, but his love for Gerd was greater. Both treasures are yours if you can convince Gerd to marry me, said Frey. Skirnir rode off on Frey's horse with Frey's gleaming sword in his hand. Magic flames burned around Gimir's hall and Jotunheim, but Frey's horse jumped through them. Skirnir pushed past the barking guard dogs and entered the giant's hall. Luckily, the giant wasn't at home. I've been sent by my master, the god Frey, he told Gerd. He would very much like to marry you. Skirnir told stories about how great Frey was, how smart and generous, how people in Midgard loved him. Skirnir reached into the sack he carried. I brought eleven golden apples of youths from Eden's tree for you. I don't want apples, Gerd waved Skirnir away. I mean, I should hope I'm worth more than a bunch of magic apples. Besides, I don't want to marry Frey. I have something better. Skirnir pulled a gold armband from his sack. This is made from the thickest gold. Stop trying to buy me, said Gerd. I don't want gold, and I don't want Frey to be my husband. Skirnir was getting desperate. He drew his sword. If you don't marry Frey, I will cut off your head. Gerd laughed a big belly laugh. She wasn't scared. If you touch one hair on my head, my father will come for you. Trust me, you do not want that. Gerd put away the sword and reached into his sack once more. He pulled out a magic wand. He cast a spell on Gerd. If you refuse to marry Frey, he will turn uglier than the ugliest troll. You will grow old. Your skin will wrinkle and your bones will ache. Gerd didn't want to be to turn ugly and old. You win. Reverse your spell. I'll marry your god. She agreed to meet Frey in the forest in nine nights to be married. Skirnir returned to Alfheim and told Frey the happy news. Nine nights? Frey didn't think he could wait that long. His heart overflowed with so much love. For nine nights, Gerd worried if she'd made a mistake. Was keeping her beauty worth it? But Gerd showed up in the forest as she'd promised. I'm here, she said to Frey unhappily. Frey got down on one knee. He told Gerd how much he cared for her and respected her. He apologized for his servant's harsh ways. He didn't want her to do anything she didn't want to. Frey wrapped her in a hug. Much to Gerd's surprise, her heart began to glow even brighter. She hugged him back. She knew then that he'd always be good to her, and they'd be happy together. At that moment, the sun shone, rain fell, and flowers bloomed again. Frey smiled, but up in Asgard, Odin frowned. He knew Ragnarok was coming, and when it did, Frey would wish he hadn't traded away his magic sword for love. Alright, we're gonna actually skip this next story, because even though it's fun, it's uh, not really relevant to the overall plot. This one, however, is probably the most important story. The Dreams of Balder, or Watch Out for the Mistletoe. Balder, the god of light, was the kindest god in all of Asgard. He always had something nice to say. He'd help anyone with anything. He was sweet and patient with his blind brother, Hod. Goodness glowed from within Balder and made him beautiful. All the gods loved Balder. All except Loki. Loki complained that Balder was too nice, too good, and too handsome. In truth, Loki was jealous. Balder was everything the mischief maker wasn't. Even when he tried to be good, evil and trouble had a way of finding Loki. Balder was married to Nana, who loved him greatly. When Balder began having bad dreams, Nana grew worried. In his dreams, he saw a flash of red and then darkness. He saw Hel, queen of the underworld, getting ready to welcome him. In every dream, he died. His mother Frigg and his father Odin were shocked to see their son so sad and scared. 
Greg hugged Balder tightly, then turned Odin. Go to hell and find out what's going on. Odin, the Allfather, hated traveling down into the darkness of Niflheim, but he knew better than to argue with his wife, especially when she was upset about their son. Odin mounted his eight-legged horse Sleipnir and galloped over the rainbow bridge out of Asgard. Sleipnir was the fastest horse in all the worlds. They rode for days until rugged land gave way to swirling mist and heavy dark clouds. The air turned bitter cold and all light disappeared. They had entered the land of the dead. Sleipnir cantered in total darkness, her hooves crunching the icy snow. They finally reached a tall iron gate. Odin banged on it with his spear. Hel, I've come to speak with you. Hel, daughter of Loki, appeared in a swirl of frosty air. The rotting skin covering half her face hung off the bone. Hel was half beautiful girl and half rotting corpse. You've come to visit? Hel was surprised. She never had visitors. You picked a busy day. Behind her, dead servants are preparing a welcoming feast. Who's all this for? Odin demanded the answer. Balder, Hel said coldly. Odin returned to Asgard. He told Frigg the sad news. Balder would soon die. No, wailed Frigg. I won't let my brilliant son go to Hel. Odin shook his head. It's his fate. The three Norns, who sit by the roots of Yggdrasil, decide what's to be, and there's nothing you or I can do. Nonsense. I'm his mother. I'll make sure my boy lives. When Frigg set her mind to something, nothing could stop her. Frigg traveled throughout all nine worlds. She made everyone and everything promise not to harm Balder. Every god, giant, troll, dwarf, and elf promised. Every animal promised, from the biggest blue whale to the smallest ant. All the trees and plants, from the towering oak to the lowly dandelion, promised. Water promised not to drown him. Fire promised not to burn him. Serpents promised not to poison him. Stones and iron promised not to bruise him. Arrows and spears promised not to pierce him. Rain, snow, wind, and fog promised not to get him lost or sick. The sun promised not to burn him. Everything in all the worlds took the oath. Frigg told Balder he would now be safe. Let's see if it really works. Loki threw an apple. It bounced off Balder's forehead. Balder grinned. Didn't hurt a bit. Other gods gathered around Balder, who stood by the well of Erd, and made a game of it. They threw plates and jugs. They threw stones and spears. They shot arrows. Nothing harmed Balder. The gods cheered. Loki hated seeing Balder celebrated. But how could he put an end to a god who could never be heard? That afternoon, an old woman dressed in black shuffled into Frigg's hall. The queen of the Aesir offered the stranger a seat at her table. The old woman listened as Frigg told the other goddesses about how she had saved Balder. The old woman whispered into Frigg's ear, Did you really get everything to take an oath? Of course, said Frigg. You didn't miss anything? asked the old woman. Come on, you can tell me. Well, I did skip over one small piece of mistletoe, admitted Frigg. The creeping vine lives on a tree to the west of Valhalla. It's young and can't survive on its own. Surely it's nothing to worry about. Suddenly, the old woman yawned. It's way past my bedtime. She left the hall and disappeared. A while later, after a quick stop to the tree west of Valhalla, Loki returned to the Welvert. He stood beside Baldur's twin brother, Hod. They listened to the gods laugh as they threw vegetables and stones at Baldur. You look sad, he said to Hod. I bet you want to join the fun. I do, said Hod, but since I'm blind, I can't see where to throw anything. I'll help you aim your arrow. Loki sneakily attached a piece of mistletoe to the tip of an arrow. He watched Hod thread the arrow into his bow. Loki guided Hod's hand so the arrow lined up with Baldur's heart. Now, said Loki. Just as Hod shot the arrow, Baldur raised his head and saw a flash of red. It was the same flash of red he'd seen in his dreams, but it was too late. The arrow pierced his body. Darkness surrounded him and he dropped to the ground and died. 
Frigg and Nana's cries echo throughout the nine worlds. Birds stopped singing. The sun dimmed. Petals wilted. Hod wept when he'd realized his beautiful brother had died because of him. The gods grabbed Hod, but then spotted Loki. They knew the mischief maker had somehow helped cause Baldur's death. But before they could do anything, Loki ran away as fast as he could. Tears streamed down Frigg's face as she covered Baldur's body with a white sheet. Someone must go to hell and bring my boy's soul back. Perhaps she will listen to reason or accept a ransom to return Baldur to us. But it can't be you, Odin. She doesn't like you. Hermod stepped forward. I will do it, mother. Hermod, the messenger of God, was also Frigg and Odin's son. Are you sure? asked Odin. Few who visit hell return. Hermod nodded bravely. Odin lent him Slepnir, for the eight-legged horse knew the way to hell. Hermod and Slepnir galloped off at top speed. It would take them nine days to reach the eternal darkness. Meanwhile, the gods wrapped Baldur's body and placed him gently on a special longboat. They would send him out to sea for his funeral. His wife, Nana, was so upset that she died of a broken heart. The gods placed her body next to Baldur's. During this time, Odin had another son with the giantess Rind. His name was Vali. When Vali was just one day old, he'd grown into a man super quickly. He killed Hod for killing Baldur. Hermod, on the back of Slepnir, finally crossed the bridge that led into the icy mist and gloom of Niflheim. The stallion leaped over Hell's enormous iron gate. Hermod entered the great hall of the dead. Baldur and Nana sat with other souls at a long table. Light no longer shone from Baldur. His skin looked gray and his eyes were dull. Hermod walked toward the tall throne at the back of the hall. The brother has arrived, sneered Hel when she spotted Hermod. Baldur is so greatly missed throughout the world, said Hermod. Please let me bring him back. Hel tapped her long fingernails together. Let's do a test. Ask every god, every giant, every dwarf, every animal, every plant, every stone, every... Well, you get the idea. If they will cry for Baldur, if everything weeps, he will be returned to the land of the living. If just one thing refuses, he will be forever mine. Hermod and Slepnir journeyed out of the darkness. For months he traveled to every corner of each of the nine worlds and asked everyone and everything he met if they'd weep for Baldur. Fire wept, clouds wept, butterflies wept, dark elves wept, squid wept, gods wept, giants wept, rivers wept, dragons wept, everything wept. Hermod had done it. Soon Baldur would be going home, but just as he was ready to leave Jotunheim, Hermod stumbled across an old giantess he'd never seen before. Will you weep for Baldur? Hermod waited for her to agree. I will not, she said. Baldur thought he was so great. Well, he wasn't. Hell can keep him. Hermod gasped. Now Baldur was doomed to stay in the land of the dead. Hermod returned to Asgard with the news. Frigg cried for a long time, then wiped away her tears. Only one giantess, you say? And you didn't recognize her? Frigg's eyes now flashed with fury. That must have been Loki in disguise. Loki caused all of this, said Odin. I'm going to find him. Thor grabbed his mighty hammer. This time, he'll be sorry when I do. Punishment for Loki, or how Loki was caught by his own net. Asgard wasn't the same without Baldur. Clouds filled the once cloudless skies. Glittery roofs didn't shine. Gods no longer hummed merry tunes. Frigg cried for her son, and Odin feared the end was near. The sea gods, Aegir and Ron, decided to throw a feast to cheer up the gods. Thor was still gone, searching for Loki, but everyone else came. Delicious food was served at long tables. For the first time in a long time, the gods began to smile. Then Loki walked in. The gods stared. Loki drank a horn of mead from a large cauldron. He ate roasted meat. He ate and drank some more. The gods stayed far away from the mischief maker. No one wanted to ruin the party. But Loki hated being ignored. He needed to be the center of attention. So he began to speak. 
He made fun of Eden's apples, teased Broggy about his poetry, and insulted Steve's hair. He mocked Njord's pretty feet and hissed at Frey's cats. Enough, boomed Odin. Loki, you are not welcome here. Loki laughed. You cannot kick me out, Odin. We're brothers. You took an oath to always have my back. True, Odin sighed. But your evil cannot continue. If I cannot stop you, then I will. Thor burst through the wooden doors of the hall. His huge body blocked all light from outside. He raised his hammer. Mjolnir will help me. No need for the hammer. I was just leaving. This party is lame. Loki darted around Thor and raced away. He ran as fast as he could to a cabin he'd built on top of a mountain by the sea. The cabin had four open doors, so he could see danger approaching from the north, south, east, and west. Loki knew Thor would hunt him and punish him, and he knew Odin wouldn't stop him this time. He needed a clever place to hide, and a good disguise. Loki changed into a salmon. He swam in a pool at the bottom of a waterfall during the day. At night, he sat by the fire in his house. What if Thor finds the waterfall? What if he discovers the salmon is really me? Could he catch me? Loki wondered. Not with his bare hands, for I'd dart away. And not with a hook. But if he had something else... Loki schemed. He twisted rope and began to tie knots. He braided the very first fishing net. Suddenly he heard a noise. He looked out his door facing west. The gods were climbing the mountains and Thor was leading the pack. Odin had spotted Loki's cabin from his high throne. They were coming for him. Loki flung the net into the fire. He dove into the waterfall and changed into a salmon, just as the gods burst into the cabin. Loki's gone, roared Thor. Look at this, Njord, god of the seas, pulled the ashes of the net from the fire with a stick. Thor scratched his beard. Look at what? It's a net to catch fish, Njord marveled. Loki's quite clever. I can make one. Tyr found a ball of rope on the floor. He tied knots, following the crisscross pattern of the ashes. Take it with us, said Njord. Let's go. Take what? Go where? Thor wished they would stop playing guessing games. To the pool at the bottom of that waterfall, said Njord. This net will help us catch fish. I bet Loki's one of them. I totally knew that. Thor held one end of the net. The other gods held the other end. They dragged it across the pool. Loki's salmon heart beat fast. He wouldn't be able to swim downstream and out to sea without being tangled in the net. He had only one choice for escape. Loki the salmon swam up the waterfall. The gods were amazed. They'd never seen a fish swim upstream before. It's Loki, cried Thor. The gods raced to the top of the waterfall with the net. As Loki the salmon tried to jump over the waterfall, Thor reached out his mighty hand and grabbed him by his tail. Loki struggled, but Thor squeezed his tail tightly. The salmon changed back into Loki form. The gods dragged him into a deep cave and tied him to three flat rocks. Skadi, daughter of the dead giant Thiazi, entered the cave. She hung a poisonous snake above Loki's head. The gods wanted him to suffer for Baldur's death, but they didn't want to kill him. They allowed Loki's wife, Sigyn, to sit by his side. Sigyn held up a bowl to catch the poison before it dripped into Loki's open mouth. But when the bowl was full, she had to leave to quickly empty it into a bubbling pit. The snake's fangs still dripped poison and the venom landed in Loki's eyes, burning them. He cried out in pain and shook so violently that the ground in Midgard shook with him. Sigyn hurried to return with her bowl, and the cycle went on and on and on. Loki, Sigyn, and the snake will stay trapped in the cave until Ragnarok comes. Ragnarok. How it all ends. We have finished with stories from the past, so now it's time to look to the future. It is a future that Odin can see with his one eye long before it will happen. The Allfather trembles because he broke his oath and allowed the gods to hurt his oath brother, Loki. He shivers because in the future, winter will not end. The 
cold whipping winds will blow more frigid than ever before. The stars will disappear. Darkness will fall. Humans in Midgard will fight. Not only their enemies, but also their friends and families. Wars will rage. Forests will burn. Mountains will crack. Gods will fight, too. The Valkyries will gather as many fallen heroes as they can, but Valhalla will soon grow too full. The dragon Nidhogg will chew through the thick roots of Yggdrasil. The world tree will tilt and its leaves will turn brown. Ragnarok will come. When it does, Loki will escape the poisonous snake and break free. He will call all who are evil to side with him against the gods. Hell will rise up from Niflheim. Fenrir the wolf will tear through the magic ribbon that holds him. Jormungand, the Midgard serpent, will bring the seas crashing over the land. Loki will command Nagvar, a ship made from the fingernails of the dead. His children and the ghosts of the dead from Niflheim will sail with him. Gorm, the vicious dog who guards Hell's Hall, will break his chains and bound into the boat. Surt, the fire demon, will leave the fiery world of Muspel to join Loki's army. Frost giants will march in from the east. Together, they will all head to Asgard. At the Bifrost, Heimdall will spot them long before they approach. The watchmen will raise Gjallarhorn and trumpet the call, signaling to the gods that they must grab their weapons. Odin will ride eight-legged Slepnir to Mimir's well to ask Mimir's head what to do. Mimir's head will whisper to Odin what its words say will give Odin hope for the future. Odin will call to the dead heroes in Valhalla to join the fight on the side of the gods. They will ride to a great field where Loki and his army awaits. This will be the final battle. This will be Ragnarok. It will be a battle that goes on for days. Hooves will pound, swords will clash, gods will fall, giants will fall. Frey will battle Surt, who holds a flaming sword brighter than a thousand suns. Frey's sword will be no match for the fire giant, and he will wish he hadn't given away his magic sword to win Gerd's heart. Frey will be the first god to die. Odin will raise his spear, Gugnir, and go after Fenrir, fight will be frightful. Fenrir will open his huge jaws and, with a snap, swallow the Allfather whole. Thor cannot help Odin, for he will be in battle with the Midgard Serpent. Thor's mighty hammer will crash against the serpent's poisonous coils. Mjolnir will crush the serpent dead just as its coils squeeze the air from Thor's lungs and its fangs poison him. Thor will entangle himself and walk nine steps before falling to the ground, dead. Vidar, Odin's son, who has not done much until now, will hurry to avenge Odin's death. Using his immense strength, Vidar will press open the wolf's lower jaw with his boot. His boot is made from scraps of leather left over from all the shoes ever made in the world. Vidar will grab Fenrir's upper jaw and yank it back, ripping the horrible wolf in half. Garm, Hell's snarling dog, will fight brave Tyr, and they will both die. Heimdall will stand against Loki. They will pierce and kill each other with their swords. The fire from Surt's blazing sword will ignite the nine worlds and drown them in flames and smoke. The two wolves will finally catch and swallow the sun and the moon. The earth will sink into the sea, and all will be destroyed. Well, not all. Before the sun is swallowed, she will give birth to a daughter. The daughter will bring light and warmth back to the sky. Rivers will flow, animals will graze, plants will grow. Thor's sons, Modi and Magni, will survive Ragnarok. Together, they will be strong enough to hold their father's mighty hammer. Honir will come from Vanaheim and ride and help, sorry, from Vanaheim and help them rule a new generation of gods. Odin's sons Vidar and Vali will also make it through the battle. Baldur and Hod will return to the land of the living. In total, seven Aesir will survive. Yggdrasil will stay alive and sprout new leaves. Two humans will step out from inside its trunk. The world tree's thick bark will have kept them safe, and its morning dew will have fed them. Their names will be Life and the Will to Live. 
they will give birth to children who will populate the earth, and the world will begin again and again. Life is a circle, wise Mimir said to Odin. When one journey ends, a new one begins. It will never be the end. And that, my friends, is Norse mythology. <laughs> Let me know what you thought down in the comments if you still happen to be awake. To be honest, I think I like Norse mythology more than Greek mythology, but that's just me. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. I hope that you have a good, 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 good